historical people, then you're going, to have, you're going to struggle with the rest of the Bible. Because throughout Scripture, you have people like Adam and Eve mentioned in the events in the garden, Cain and Abel mentioned through the rest of Scripture, Noah, which is where we are right now. Of course, Abraham, we're introduced to Abraham in Genesis chapter 11. And then, of course, his life takes over, the account of his Life takes over there in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis, the, in particular, the early chapters of Genesis, is truly the foundation for the rest of Scripture. And if we misunderstand it, if we, uh, as some people try to do, allegorize it, you know, some people try to make the first 11 chapters of Genesis like a poem, well, like I said, you're going you're gonna to really struggle... Just for instance, in, when Jesus was talking about the second coming in Matthew 24, when he's talking about the coming of the Son of Man, he says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, so also it will be when the Son of Man comes. Well, if Noah's stuff didn't really happen, that's meaningless. The second coming is meaningless. Because if one didn't happen, the other can't happen. All right, so these first 11 chapters of Genesis are integral to the rest of Scripture. All right? We are starting tonight in chapter 6 and verse 13. Last week we looked at the first 12 verses and then verse 22 of chapter 6, setting the stage with Noah himself. We talked a bit, if you remember, about the holiness of God and sin. We talked about the death of innocent people, children in particular, things like that. Um, so I don't want to recover that ground tonight, but we actually get into some details now about the flood itself and how Noah and his family, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, were saved by water. All right. Somebody read Genesis 3. <laughs> what? Genesis 6, 13 to 15. Genesis 6, 13 to 15. All right, a lot there, but let's just start there with verse 13. The end of all flesh has come before me, and we talked about that a little bit last week, and that's what it says. Everything in whose nostrils the breath of life was is going to perish in the flood. Now, obviously, your sea creatures are not going to die, and the eight souls that are on the ark, and then, of course, the animals that are taken on the ark. And by the way... You know, there's been some, I'm kind of jumping ahead here. It's kind of interesting to see the speculation about the gathering of the animals. Somebody just, let's put that to bed real quick. Somebody read verse 20 here and see how this happened. They will what? They will come to you. Noah didn't have to go out with a leash and collar and round up the animals and catch them in a net or anything like that. You say, well, how in the world did that happen? Uh, that's one of those questions that I would respond with, I don't know. But the God who spoke everything into existence said that that was how it was going to happen. And so that's how it happened. So don't ask me any more questions on that, all right? Okay. Okay. God has revealed many times in Scripture, uh, to the righteous specifically, that a time of judgment was coming. And I, I list here Genesis 18. This is where he told Abraham about what was going to happen in connection with Sodom and Gomorrah and then the cities of the plain. You read your prophets, both major and minor prophets, and time and time again, the prophets, God reveals to the prophets and then the prophets to the people, the day of the Lord is at hand. We see that phrase throughout um, Throughout all of your prophets, all, what is it, 17, five major, 12 minor prophets. Well, so this is not anything new. Now, let's talk about this ark. Gopher wood, all right? 
Gopher wood, most linguists believe this to be probably cypress. They say cypress is very buoyant. And uh, there, I actually heard, I heard a pretty convincing argument that it doesn't, it, that gopher isn't necessarily talking about the type of wood, but how it would be cut, squared. I don't know, but this is what most linguists say, probably something like this. Now, that's very specific. Okay, let's say it is referring to cypress. There's a lot of different trees out there. Uh, God is extremely specific with what He wants with this ark. But then what's the next thing after gopher wood? Listed. Rooms. How many rooms, God? I don't know. He didn't tell Him. All right? But then you've got to pitch it within and without with pitch. Uh, one of the definitions in the Hebrew dictionary is asphalt. Uh, some, some type of waterproofing material that you cover this thing with. What about its size? Well, 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits. Length, width, height. Now, a cubit, and again, this is, we're talking millennia ago. Uh, a cubit ranges anywhere in different civilizations in history from 17 inches to 21 inches. So what we have typically done is talk about is 18 inches. We just round it to essentially a foot and a half as a cubit. So those are the measurements. Um, if it is, if we can approximate it, your arc would be 450 feet long. Uh, football field and a half. If you've been into a football game, 450 feet. Yeah. We'll talk about that. I would say the, the, that them coming to him was miraculous, because that doesn't just happen. Uh, but the, the preservation of them, so it rains for 40 days. They're actually on the ark for around 390 days. But we'll, we'll total all that up. I have no doubt in my mind that God was involved, but I don't, I don't think all of that necessarily was miraculous, if that makes sense. So you've got this massive structure. Have any of you guys been to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky? Nobody. You know it would be neat if we had a church trip. I know a lot of congregations have done that. You go to the Creation Museum. You go to the Ark Encounter. A group of us get together, charter a bus, and uh, just do that. That's sounding better all the time. Kim's paying for it. All right. Kim Ragsdale's back there with the thumbs up. So we'll see her after class and get that all set up. No, seriously, that, that, that would be something to see. I mean, you can Google it if you've got your phone with you. It's, it's, it's an amazing, even just looking at the pictures, it's quite an amazing scene. Joe and Kim have gone. Okay. Yeah. I saw a documentary on it, on the building of it and stuff, and then a walkthrough. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. So, so you've got specifics, you've got generics, and again, the cubits would be very specific. A window, a space for light, and I don't think this is talking about like a square. Um, what we are told about the window in the ark, somebody read verse 16 of Genesis 6. Okay, so the, the Hebrew word for window is actually light source. So perhaps that, I've seen diagrams of what it perhaps looked like. The, the upper deck may have had like a, oh, how would you say it? Kind of like an awning appearance where all the way around there's a source of light. Of course, that would be ventilation and everything. I would say that's speculative, but anyway, you have a space for light. You have the door, a door. Isn't that what it said there, Tristan? Make a door in the side of the ark. And then you've got three decks or three stories. So you have, 
Again, getting back to this idea here, you have both generic commands and specific commands. God is very specific in some ways. Go for wood, the cubits, one source of light and one door and three stories. But then rooms, and that, that word rooms in the Greek is interesting, nests. I don't think that these animals are just roaming free and walking around everywhere. They were actually... Some, there was actually some type of constructed habitat for each animal. So it seems to be based on the wording here. How many? It doesn't say. Well, obviously, it would be based on the numbers, and we'll talk about that here when we get into more into chapter 7. Generic and specific authority. Now, we can, we can learn, you know, whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Romans 15, 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 11 talks about using to, reading looking at the Old Testament and bringing things over and learning from them. So what might we be able to take from the example of Noah's Ark in terms of generic and specific authorization for things? The church, all right, so be specific. Who said that, by the way? Okay, so let's be specific with that, all right? How might we utilize... Generic and specific, specific authority for the church. Hmm? Follow them. Yeah. I mean, like, what is something specific about the church in Scripture that, that we emulate today? Okay. We know how they worship, specifically. Yeah, how to obey the gospel. Um... What about, do what? Okay, the eldership, deacons. There's a, there are a lot of specifics in regard to the church. What about generic? What, what might you think could be something that is authorized for us to do, but in a, in a way that's not specific, like a list of qualifications for a man who wants to serve as an elder or deacon? Any ideas? Okay. The order of our worship service in general. It doesn't matter. Um, you, you, you all have visited around to various congregations over the years, and so have I. No two congregations look exactly the same, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, you said the Lord's Supper. I've seen, I've seen congregations where, in terms of the Lord's Supper, they'll have a song before the bread, a song before the fruit of the vine, and then a song before giving. And there's not a thing in the world wrong with that. Songs that are specified for that particular thing that we're getting ready to do. You, you throw that in the mix in some places and people would lose their, they would just blow their stack. We're liberal now. So, spe, uh, generic authority, order of worship. What else? What time we meet, how long we meet, where we meet. I mean, there's a lot of things like this. So, that's one of the values of knowing your Old Testament. Not just these historical, again, historical characters and events, locations and things, but how to, how to ascertain Bible authority. How does the Bible authorize me to do what I do? One of the, one of the old classics, classic examples that I've heard many times, and perhaps you've heard it too, is like, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, the specific is, preach the gospel. The generic is, go. Doesn't matter how you go, just go. So, that's just another example. Uh, but whatever the case may be, God is directing Noah here because, going back up to verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I, I touched on that last week. As God, He handles this how He sees right. And I... Let's go ahead and touch on this. Somebody read chapter 7 and verse 1 here. I don't want to deal with this too much, but just read 7-1. All right. That's why he's spared. He found grace. But why did he find grace, according to 7-1? Because he's righteous. So there's no conflict with the grace of God and us doing what 
is right. That's what it means to be righteous, is to be right. All right, any questions or comments on verses 13 to 17? Right. I've actually read that account myself, and I'm. It's been a long time, but yeah, I remember. I remember that built on the same, not same size, but same dimensions. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. It's almost like God knows what He's doing. All right, somebody read Genesis 6, 18 through 21, please. How long did all this take? I don't know. But you've got the animals coming to him, but then you have the command, you need to go out and gather the food. Well, they've got to survive on the ark. And that's even a part of the ark encounter. They have, uh, I guess you would say, examples of what that might have looked like, how, where they would have stored the food and all of that. But anyway, uh, the, the first two bullet points I should have reversed here under this section. Verse 18 is the first word in the Bible of this, first use of this word in the Bible, covenant. All right? A covenant is simply this. It's an agreement between two or more parties. That's all it is. But then the first bullet point. The parties of the covenant, typically speaking, are not equal, but both have a part to fulfill. That's your next blank to put, fill in. They both have a part to fulfill. All right? God makes promises. Noah has commands. And the gospel is the same way. There are promises to be enjoyed, there are commands to be obeyed. We live under the new covenant. You know, the book of Hebrews talks about that. It talks about the, the first covenant as opposed to the second covenant, things like this. So it's simply an agreement between two or more parties. Noah did as God required, and God did as He promised. I'm going to destroy everything. Everything, in, again, in whose nostrils the breath of life is, but you and your family go into the ark. Noah neither earned nor deserved this agreement. He was righteous, and God acknowledges that. But could God not have just completely started over? I think He could have. Yeah. Well, that's the next sentence. This text is a great commentary on grace. That's your next blank. Perhaps. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> well, most people say that that 120 years is connected with that in some way. Yeah, well, again, it's not just the animals, it's the food. 
provisions that would be necessary. Somebody on the live stream said they had no refrigeration, so I tend to believe God kept their food from spoiling. I, so back to what Colin asked earlier, I, so obviously there's man involved in what man could do, but there's God involved too, no question about that. So, hmm? not as far as we're, we're told. Yeah. And, and see, that's kind of one of the things, one of the threads that we've been continuing to pull through all, all of these first six chapters is how much isn't recorded for us here? You know, in terms of creation, in terms of the garden, and Cain and Abel, there is, I would say there is, there are probably volumes that is not, volumes more that are not recorded than what is recorded for us. And I, cert, I think that's certainly true with what we're reading here with Noah. Right. Their shoes didn't wear out. Yeah. Right. Well, and when he did die, he was he was still a strong man, full of vigor, and yeah. Yeah, well, like, do what now? <laughs> That's a good question. We would ask questions like that in preaching school, and the instructor would be like, you just earned a five-page paper on that. <laughs> and they weren't kidding. So, be careful. Eggs and milk, that was a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Maybe he's a big, big chicken. I don't know. I'm going to go over here because <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. All these questions are, what do you think? Well, think about, think about some of the things that Jesus said. I think, what is, is this Matthew chapter 12? Um, the men of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. And a greater than Jonah is here, and you won't repent. You know, he had the miracles, and, and not just, I hate to use the word common miracles, like healing the sick, but, you know, miracles that, okay, healing the sick versus raising a dead person. And people saw that, and they killed him. Oh, sure. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Maybe. We're just not told. You'd like to think, though, that something of that scale going on for that long would impress somebody. I would hope so, yeah. Hmm. No. No. So this text is a great commentary on grace because God, being God in his pure holiness, could have handled it differently, and he didn't. There, there is an idea that the God that we read about in the Old Testament is quite different from the God that we read about in the New Testament, and nothing could be further from the truth. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6, 8. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. But what does the grace of God do? So it's appeared to all men and it brings salvation. But then Titus 2.12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. God's grace appeared to Noah, but it taught Noah that you've got, you've got to build an ark and here's how I want it built. 
Same thing. Different covenants, a different law, but it's the same God functioning in the same way. Yeah. It, well, and even there's an old sermon that goes back, you know, it's been preached no telling how many hundreds, maybe thousands of times by all kinds of preachers. I've preached it myself over the years of the ark and the church. There's one way to get in. There's one source of light. Um, the provision is on the inside. Judgment's on the outside, you know, so, yeah. Right. Well, while the ark was a par- while the ark was a preparing, wherein few that is eight souls were saved through water, the like figure, baptism now saves us. First Peter three twenty and twenty one. Yeah. Okay. Bring two of every sort. Verses nineteen and twenty. Obviously, the verse uh, end of verse nineteen tells us to keep them alive. So you've got obviously. Reproduction here and force that goes back to what you were talking about and God speaking it into creation. Here's here's a perhaps a way to think about it. When God did initially miraculously create ex nihilo out of nothing, in that moment he established the laws of reproduction. And so you see that in action here. Take two of every sort, a male and its female, that you may replenish the earth. The Hebrew simply says, two of every. Now, a discussion is, well, how do they all fit on the ark? So look down at your, the last bullet point in this section. The ark's storage capacity would have been approximately the same as 450, what are they, 53 foot long semi-trailers? That's a lot of, that's a lot of tonnage. It's a lot of square footage. So, two of every sort. Now, does that mean... Uh, to a male and female chocolate lab, a male and female Rottweiler, a male and female Labradoodle. No. You need two dogs, a male and a female. You don't have to have two of every single, what would you call it, type of breed. You just need two canines and two felines and two bovines and all of this, and that greatly reduces the numbers that would be necessary. Um, but, you know, skeptics grab a hold of this, and of course, you know, well, there's no way you could fit all of those, two of every animal that was alive on the earth. That's not what God said. Two of every sort. Two of every. If I were in charge, there would be. Yeah. Me and Sandy, right? Two, there'd be more than two cats on there. <laughs> could have been young. Well, and a lot, you just think about it, a lot of animals are relatively small anyway, um, particularly your domesticated animals. So there's a lot to consider that. Are you asking for a term paper or something? <laughs> no, that's a, no, sir, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know. But they were on there for a year, at least. Probably closer to a year and a month, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Two of every. Rodents. I don't know. They're still here. That's a good point. And they're really coming out right now, aren't they? (laughs) All right, let's go on into chapter 7. The extent, your next blank here, the extent of the flood is reemphasized in verse 4. Somebody read Genesis 7, 4.
What's it going to destroy? All living things that I've made. When you, the last time I checked, when you pour out water, it doesn't pile up. What does water do? It seeks its own level, doesn't it? You, don't, you can't make a pile of water. So, it would make no sense, because what, what folks often do, and again, in, a, in, a, in an attempt to perhaps understand it from our perspective, well, this was a localized flood somewhere in Mesopotamia. Well, if that's the case, if we're taking this as an actual historical event, actual historical characters, and it's just a local flood, then why would Genesis 7, 4 say what it says? Every living substance that I have made, and notice how it says that, every living what? Substance that I have made. Um, I will destroy from off the face of the earth. If it, it can't be a localized flood based on the language. Again, if we're going to take it literally, the way that it needs to be taken, there's nothing in the text in any of these early chapters of Genesis that indicates allegory, metaphor, uh, simile, any figure of speech like that. It's all recorded as, as, his, as actual history. So the extent of the flood is reemphasized. Point number two, and this is, the, I had us read Genesis 7, 1 earlier, but let's get back to that now. Righteousness is visible. That's your next blank. Being righteous is visible. It's not a feeling you have. Being right with God is not... And I've heard people express it that way. Well, I think I'm okay. Why would you say that? I mean, that's the question to ask. Why would you say that you think you're okay? What, what does it mean that you feel that you're in a right relationship with God? Scripture never speaks of it that way. Righteousness is visible. Somebody turn over to Matthew 5 and read verse 20 just by way of example. Yeah, so people are commenting. One person said, all the breeds that we have today wouldn't have been alive then. And that's true. And they wouldn't have had to have been alive. I mean, again, in the beginning, God set the laws of reproduction. And in time, breeds vary. And particularly with disease and death and what would you, uh, mutations, things change over time. Uh, all right. What did I say? Matthew 5.20. Somebody read that. Okay, how would you be able to know that anybody's righteousness exceeds anybody else's? Maybe, if you turn over a page or two to uh, uh, chapter 7 around verse, is it verse 15, Matthew 7? By their fruits you will know them. Is that verse 15? Matthew 7? No? 16? Okay. Well, what does that mean? By your fruits you will... It's visible. Being right with God is visible. You don't feel it. You don't think it. Now, you can know it. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but it's not just, well, I think I'm okay with God. Well, are you or not? Do you, do you measure up to His standard of righteousness? Because if you do, well, it's like... Uh, it's like 1 John 3, 9 says, He who does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. So righteousness is visible. That's one of the important things that we learn in the account of, in the account of Noah. Um, okay, so if this were a localized flood, as some claim, verse 3 would make no sense. What does verse 3 say? Of fowls also of the air by sevens. I got the wrong verse there. I need verse 4. But the end of verse 3 does say, uh, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth, of, of all the earth, universal language there. And also, excuse me, this is the first time that clean animals are distinguished from unclean in the biblical text. There's a clear delineation. And that should cause us to see that not everything God communicated is recorded for us. The Bible's not written to answer every question you will ever have. It's just not. So, there are some things that we take by faith. Faith is not just a blind acceptance of hopes and wishes, either. Faith is based on evidence, but there are some things we, just, we cannot know. But we know God, and we know His activity throughout time, and we know His power and all of that. And so, 
in that sense, sometimes we have to take things on faith, don't we? Mm. Well, because everything that's not on the ark is going to die. All of it. Well, if you're not on the ark, you're part of the all. <laughs> so. Gail has a good point. If you're in the ark, if Gail has a good point, if you're in the ark, you're not on the earth anymore. You're floating in the water. How about that? Is that? She'll, all right. Forrest, Forrest accepts that answer. <laughs> all right, guys. So next week, our gospel meeting will be going on. Really looking forward to that. So appreciate your attention tonight. Oh, the Ark Encounter? It's probably more than a family of eight. Yeah. Went into Kentucky.